time of year again. We're back. Good. Y'all have a population? We do, yes. Good. One, one. Good to see you. Thanks, you too. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. 7.02 p.m. on Monday, March the 20th, and certainly welcome all of you that are in attendance. Uh, if we could just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. Last Councilman Davis, you would lead us in the pledge. <laughs> Mayor Bell, Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, Councilmember Davis, Councilmember Johnson, Councilmember Moffitt, Councilmember Reese, Here. and Councilmember Shule. We have two uh, proclamations that we'd like to present this evening. Uh, I'm going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem if she would join me. The first one has to do with the Durham Crop Hunger Walk. And, 
And while, while I'm doing that, normally uh, we will be presenting the Neighborhood Spotlight Award recipient this evening. But unfortunately, I was told that uh, the recipient of that award, Ms. Alice Cheek, who many of you probably remember from our Call for Council of the Edgemont Ellens community, uh, is fortunately she's in the hospital and won't be able to be with us this evening. So it will be presented at the appropriate time. Uh, I'm going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem if she would read this proclamation. Uh, this is the one with Durham Croft Crop Hunger Walk. And we'll ask Karen if she would join us. Oh, you're right behind us. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, this is a proclamation, and it reads as follows. Whereas at the end of World War II, many people wanted to share our country's abundance with European war veterans. And crops' first purpose was to gather wheat and other crops from U.S. farms for shipment to Europe. And whereas today the Durham Crop Hunger Walk is an important part of community life, bringing together people of different faiths, different socioeconomic levels, diverse cultures, and all age groups to provide local and international hunger aid. And whereas in the last 42 years, Durham Crop Hunger Walks have raised over $4 million to help and bring hope to hungry people in need around the world and here in the United States. And whereas, each year, Durham Crop Hunger Walk helps local agencies such as Meals on Wheels, Urban Ministries, Housing for New Hope, Double Bucks for SNAP, Threshold Clubhouse, Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina, Families Moving Forward, Open Tables, PYO, St. Andrew's Society, and church food pantries who provide food to our Durham neighbors in need. And whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk raised over $145,000 last year, and whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk's goal is to raise enough money to be able to support two additional local agencies this year, and whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk in 2017 will dedicate all of the internationally designated funds over what was raised last year to refugee, refugee aid. And whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk is the oldest fundraising walk in North Carolina and will hold its 43rd annual Crop Hunger Walk on Sunday, April 2nd, and whereas the Durham Hunger Walk helps the community to become aware of and concerned about hunger and its causes, and whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk is the second largest crop walk in the nation, that's amazing, out of more than 1,000 walks demonstrating the tremendous compassion and altruism of Durham citizens. Now, there are four. I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 2nd, 2017 as Durham Crop Hunger Walk Day in Durham and hereby urge all the citizens to take special note of this observance. Again, April 2nd, 2017, Durham Crop Hunger Walk Day. Karen, thank you for all the work that you do. It's amazing. You're in everything. <laughs> you want to say something? I, I would, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem and, and council members and staff and, and uh, everyone for having us here. Um, as um, Cora mentioned, we for many years have been the third largest walk in the country and we are very excited that we have made it up to number two. So um, I just wanted to point that out, draw a little attention to that because we're very excited about it. But I also want to say that while 
when that's based on the amount of money we raise. And while the amount of money we raise is important, I think what's even more important is the people that we're able to help. And I brought some brochures, and I will leave them so people can pick them up on the way out. But in our brochure, our theme this year is Neighbors Feeding Neighbors, which I think is a great description of the walk. But there are actual pictures of people who we've made a difference for. Um, three of them are local people, and three of them are people who we provided international relief for. Um, but I think it's important to remember that it's not just about raising money, but it's about changing lives. Um, and not only do we have a very diverse group of people who receive aid from crop walks, but we have a very diverse group of people who participate. So we have a number, I think, six, eight, 70 some um, faith congregations, faith worship, places of worship. Um, we have schools, we have businesses, we have nonprofit organizations. Many of the ones we serve actually walk in the walk. Um, so it, it's very exciting to me that this is such a great representation of Durham, all parts of Durham, all ages, all um, families, individuals. Um, so we, we invite you to come. Um, one thing that's new this year is that, um, as uh, Cora mentioned, we are distributing any money above what we raised last year of our international relief money will go to refugee resettlement. So some of that um, stays here in Durham. There's a Church World Service office in Durham that resettles refugees. Some of it will also be for um, actual relief to refugees who are looking for homes. So um, we really encourage folks to work on getting their sponsors up so we can um, make a good, good, good contribution. So I would like to invite you all to come. And um, of course, for our city council members, we have provided... Oh, we provided them all with um, one of our t-shirts from this year's walk. So you will be properly attired when you come. Um, but I just want to call out to uh, Mia Little, who is an NCCU student who designed the shirt this year. Their class, as part of their assignment, designs logos, possible logos for the shirt. So uh, she is not here. She will be at the walk, though. So, And we also want to thank Cora, who will be speaking on behalf of the city um, at the walk. Thank you. I'd like to ask Councilman Shule if he would join me, please. This is a very special proclamation, as all of our proclamations are, but it recognizes Paula Murray Family Home National Historic Landmark Day. And I know Barbara Lau is here and John. Steve is the editor, and I guess I'm the co-editor of this proclamation, but <laughs> Steve did it all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey. Hello. Good to see you. I'm going to read this proclamation. Uh, congratulations on the designation of the Pauli Murray Family Home as a National Historic Landmark. Whereas the Pauli Murray Family Home at 906 Carroll Street has been designated a National Historic Landmark by the National Park Service and U.S. Department of the Interior because of its association with groundbreaking African-American civil rights activist, lawyer, feminist, educator, writer, Episcopalian priest, and LGBTQ community member, Polly Murray. And whereas Polly Murray was born November 20, 1910, almost 107 years ago and grew up in Durham, North Carolina, as part of a prominent African-American family, the granddaughter of educator and Union Army veteran Robert Fitzgerald, the grandniece of brickmaker and banker Richard Fitzgerald, and the niece of longtime Durham Public School teacher Pauline Fitzgerald Dame. And whereas Polly Murray was an acclaimed author who wrote Proud Shoes, the story of an American family published in 1956, which offers an unprecedented glimpse of early Durham and the significant life experiences of her family members. And whereas Polly Murray was a social justice activist in the United States and abroad, and a tireless fighter who demonstrated fearlessness and courage in her lifelong struggle for racial and gender equity and serves as an example for LGBTQ people living, living out their sexual orientation and gender identities. And, whereas, Polly Murray wrote state laws on race and color for the Women's Division of Christian Services, which was labeled the Bible by Thurgood Marshall and was instrumental in the landmark 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education and other civil rights cases. And, whereas, Polly Murray served as an advisor to Eleanor Roosevelt and was appointed by John F. Kennedy to the President's Commission on the Status of Women, 
Committee, P PCSW, on Civil Rights and Political Rights, and whereas Polly Murray was a founding member of the National Organization for Women in 1966 and coined the term, term Jane Crow in recognition of the interrelated discrimination faced by women and people of color and crafted a feminist legal strategy later used by Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg to win protections for women in the workplace. And whereas Polly Murray was the first African-American woman to graduate from the Howard University School of Law in 1944 at the top of her class and the first African-American woman to be ordained as an Episcopal priest in 1977 and was named to the Book of Holy Women, Holy Men, a celebration of saints in 2012 and Whereas, Polly Murray's legacy has inspired the Polly Murray Project at the Duke Human Rights Center, Franklin Humanities Institute, and the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice to shine a light on her life of human rights activism, create opportunities for open community dialogue, document Durham's lesser known histories, and use history as a tool for addressing contemporary social justice issues. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, do hereby proclaim April 1, 2017 as Polly Murray Family Home National Historic Landmark Day in Durham, North Carolina, and commend its observance to all citizens in recognition of this distinction for our community. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this 20th day of March 2017, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor. Congratulations to you all. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Pauli Murray Center for History and Social Justice and the Pauli Murray Project, and we are just so proud to be North Carolina's 39th National Historic Landmark, and in fact, the very first focused on women's history. So I really think that's a lot to celebrate, and we want you to join us in that. Uh, on April 1st, Saturday, April 1st, we'll have a celebration at the Pauli Murray House, which is at 906 Carroll Street from one to five. Um, Mayor Bell and um, County Commissioner Wendy Jacobs will be there, a uh, representative from GK Butters, Butterfield's office, um, family members. We've um, actually commissioned an original poem uh, to open that ceremony. And then there'll be participatory art projects and two exhibits, one new exhibit about Polly's connections between women's rights and civil rights. And you'll get to go in the first floor of the house. So. Um, I hope that you all can join us. It's all free. Everyone is welcome. And we hope to see you there uh, Saturday, April 1st. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, last weekend, young chess players from across the state gathered in Raleigh for the 2017 North Carolina Scholastic Chess Championships. Competing in the division that encompasses grades kindergarten through fifth grade, which is known as the K through five division, was an intrepid team from Durham's own Moorhead Montessori School, the Moorhead Meerkats. There were 31 total teams in that division, and Moorhead Montessori was the only public elementary school here in Durham to field a team. Our Moorhead Meerkats finished eighth in their division, which is really awesome. The Meerkats were led by a scrappy fourth grader named Elias. Elias earned five points out of a possible seven points in the tournament with four wins, two draws, and one loss. By the way, one of those draws was against a player who had twice his rating. It was really amazing, uh, which earned Elias a, title, a tie for 11th place overall out of 150 participants in the K-5 through division. As a fourth grader, Elias also received what's known as a class prize for doing extremely well given his initial chess rating going into the tournament. Uh, he, came in, uh, he came in first among all competitors who entered the tournament rated below 1,000. Uh, and as it turned out throughout the course of the tournament, Elias ended up facing the most difficult opponent list of any competitor in the tournament. Pretty amazing for a fourth grader. Mr. Mayor, when you hear how well Elias did in the tournament, it might not surprise you to learn that Elias's dad is the coach of the Moorhead Meerkats chess team. But it may surprise you to learn, although some folks here may see her beaming from the other end of the dais, I may have already guessed that Elias's mom is our colleague, City Council Member Jillian Johnson. I know that Jillian and Paul are so very proud of Elias and his team, so congratulations to Elias and all of the Meerkats from Moorhead Montessori for their outstanding performance in the 2017 North Carolina Scholastic Chess Championships.
Super. That's great. Great things are happening in Durham, right? All right. Uh, are there other announcements, comments? Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I'd like to congratulate the uh, Thomas Mentoring Leadership Academy on its awards ceremony on Saturday. That group is mentoring close to 13, 13 to 15 uh, young black boys and are doing, that group is doing an outstanding job. They are incredible. But what was so special about the awards uh, luncheon was the recognition of one of our police department employees, uh, Terrence uh, Assembly, uh, for his work with that mentoring program. So I applaud him uh, and the police department for all that they're trying to do to help save our young black children. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, any other announcements by council members? If not, uh, entertain the city manager's priority items. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, everyone, uh, no priority items. Uh, likewise, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, no priority items. Uh, likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we'll move the agenda, the first item being the consent agenda. Those items can be approved with a single vote. If a council member or a member of the audience chooses to remove a consent agenda item, we will discuss that item later in the agenda. I read the heading of each one. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item three is last mile agreement between the city of Durham and the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Item four is contract amendment number one. This, oh, I do have the wrong one. Blame it on the city manager since he pulled mine up. Hold on a minute. I, I, I got it now. I'll do it. Is that it? I thought those things sound familiar. Anyway. <laughs> okay, we'll start again. Approval of city council minutes, item one. Item two is the item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item three is the Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee reappointment. Item four is the Durham City County Appearance Commission appointments. Item five are grants draw drawdown performance audit. Item six is FY 2016-2017 Emergency Solutions Grant and City General Funds Housing for New Hope, Inc. Subrecipient Contract Rapid Rehousing Project. Item seven is interlocal agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation and the City of Raleigh for the Regional Strategic Toll Study. Item nine is FY 2015 and 20, FY 2016 Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Grant Project Ordinance. Item 10 is the bid report for January 2017. Item 11 is acceptance of 10,000 electric vehicle charging station grant from Duke Energy. Item 12 is CIP ordinance amendment and grant resolution for the West Elevate Creek Trail Phase 2 project, tip number C-5572. Item 13 is the construction contract for the West Elevate Creek Trail Phase 2 project, tip number C-5572. Item 14 is construction engineering and inspections contract for the West Elevate Creek Phase 2 project, tip number C-5572. Item 16, 18, and 19 items that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 20 is a contract with Meritech Incorporated for laboratory services for the stormwater quality program. Item 21 is contract amendment number six for ST2264C for Fedboro Road Improvements and Ordinance Amendment number 14945. Item 22 is a contract amendment number two for ST277C Project Management Services for installation of fiber optic cable. Items 26 to 29 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. We'll entertain a motion for the approval of the consent so agenda. Moved, it's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? 
Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we move to the general, general business agenda. Item two is Recreation Advisory Commission appointment. Item 16 is <coughs> telecommunications license agreement with Teleport. I'm sorry. Yes, Mayor Bell. Uh, David Falleroff has received four votes for appointment to the Recreation Advisory Commission. Thank you. Item 16 is telecommunications. So what? I think you, you were reading the vote. You were reading from the vote, right? Yes, I read it. Um, item 16 is the telecommunications license agreement with Teleport Communications America LLC. Uh, I have Robert DeRoe, who's here to speak, who's raised. Do you want to speak on this item? Do you have to raise and ask a question? Okay. Martin Williams with the Department of Public Works, just here to answer any questions you have. Sure, this is Robert DeRoe with AT&T. He's here to address any questions that the council may have related to the various license agreements that were on the work session last week uh, under the different subsidiary companies that AT&T owns and that are operating within the city limits. Uh, there were a couple of issues that the council raised as far as work performance by AT&T over the last year during their broadband install. So at the request of council, Mr. DeRoe is here to address any questions that you may have. Well, there, there are really three items related to that, items 16, 18, and 19. Uh, so let me ask all the questions by members of the council on item 16. Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Marvin. Um, so uh, my first questions are for the administration, which is uh, can you uh, describe or, or what, let, let me ask you just this, what information do we have about the, um, the, the amount of work that's being done by our staff in order to, in terms of the investigations, are we follow, finding a lot? Do we have any numbers on how many times we're having to uh, get AT&T, in these cases, this is AT&T and two of its, well, these are, these are all really AT&T companies, subsidiaries. Uh, do we have figures on the amount of times that we've had to ask them to stop work or uh, make changes? So there should have been a memo attached to either this agenda item or one okay. of the other items that were directly related to AT&T's work that gave you all the information okay. requested at the it's work session. It's on item session. 19, Mr. Shul. Okay, thank you. And, and Mayor Bell and Council, thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, if I can clarify, item number 16 is PFNet. Uh, they're a subsidiary of AT&T and they only uh, do work in, actually it's Teleport, they were PFNet. They have a uh, uh, interim license agreement. They're asking for a renewal license agreement. They only do about one um, uh, permit per year. They are, they are not in the build plan that Mr. Williams <coughs> is going to talk about. Uh, so they would not come under the question that you just asked. And then also the number 18, I think, is AT&T Corp. They're the long distance uh, leg of this. And they would also, they only do one or two permits per year. So they would not also come <coughs> under the questions that uh, Mr. Williams is going to answer. But the, all the questions that you have are for BST, Bell South Telecommunications, doing business as AT&T. Thank you. That's helpful. Yes, sir. And in a minute, I'm going to get this memo to come up, which I'm sorry I didn't realize we had. Um, but I appreciate y'all adding it. Let's see. Are you still on 16? Uh, well, I, th I think these all go together, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I understand what Robert's saying. Uh, so uh, I guess my questions go particularly to the, to the uh, which one did you say, Robert? 19? I believe it's 19. It's yeah. BST. Yeah. Yes. Well, but before we go, I guess I want to 
Sure. Do, do you have, it's a recommendation that the Department of Public Works recommends the City Council authorize the City Manager to enter into a right of way telecommunications license agreement with Teleport Communications America, LLC. Are, are the Council ready to entertain that motion now, that recommendation, or do you want to wait until you go through 18 and 19? It doesn't matter. Either way, it's good. Well, if, if people are comfortable, why don't we move, move on this item 16, the recommendation? been proper to move and second further discussion here and on madam clerk we open the vote close the vote it passes you, did you mean to vote yes it passes seven to zero uh, so the next item is telecommunications license agreement with bell south telecommunications llc doing business as at and t that, that's the one that we want to wait on yes bell south telecommunications well, I, I just read it, so that's the one we're talking about. So we're on item 18. 18. And I would ask other questions, comments by members of the council, recognize the council sure. Just to be clear, this is the one where these most of these permits are, is that your? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let me, I appreciate it. I've had a chance here to quickly glance at this memo, which I appreciate. I'm sorry I didn't realize we had. Um, and I see, uh, There's a list of the, the complaints that have been logged, and it looks like AT&T has about 523 uh, complaints that have been logged in a period uh, since June of 2015. That's correct. Is that right? And how about, and then I see here we have the stop work orders, which follow that, is that right? That's what that next chart is? That's correct. It gives you a date of the various stop work orders, if it was crew specific or if it was a full citywide shutdown. And so this looks like about six or seven times. Uh, the once was Google, but the, the others were AT&T. There was a, a full citywide shutdown uh, and various crew shutdowns for Lack of restoration citywide, various violations, working past a lot of time. Um, so let me just say uh, to Mr. DeRoe, that's a lot. Um, and the, that's a, not, not just the, uh, the full, the, not just the shutdowns, but the complaints log, that's a complaint logged at least, I don't know, maybe an average of one a day since that time. So could you count, could you, could you comment on your, your plans and practices uh, regarding this? And you, you and I have spoken on the phone earlier, I appreciated your call last week. Uh, but could you, uh, could you comment on that? Yes, sir. Um, with this being a full scale deployment into Durham as a new um, I guess a new area for us to be deployed in. We have had uh, maybe roughly 40,000 limit units we've passed, so the 500 complaints in the last two years um, is about a percent, one and a half percent of the residents that we have passed. Uh, I do also believe that those, most of the complaints and most of the shutdowns have occurred at the very beginning or towards the middle of the deployment and that those numbers have decreased recently. We have uh, regular calls with the city of Durham at their request. We come and meet with the city of Durham and talk about best practices and um, try to do everything that we can to uh, mitigate these complaints. Um, I don't think that there are any open complaints that we have not addressed. Um, so I feel like the, uh, we are getting better and we have uh, any of those crews that were shut down crew specific, we have made sure that they are not working in Durham now. Thank you. Um, and for our staff again, um, this contract, what's the, what would be the length of time of this contract? This is, a, this is a, just to get us through. So this is the the license, actually the I mean, license oh, the agreement, license agreement to allow yeah. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what is, the, what is the length of time of it? Does it have a time? Uh, if I could, it does not have an okay, ending date. It's a license agreement. We're in an interim agreement right now with mm -hmm. the city of Durham that's yeah. been in place since 2000. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so this 2017 agreement is just, um, I guess, updating the interim agreement. Okay. All righty. And um, so, again, uh, this is costing us, the, the inspections, something like $4 million over the next couple of years, taxpayers' money. And um, as you know, uh, the council passed a, an ordinance which said that we would be recovering 50% of the direct costs that we incurred. Um, and the legislature uh, overturned this. They said that we were not allowed to charge those permitting fees any further, uh, even though we had been collecting permitting fees. Um, and uh, I know that the U and the other utilities went to the legislature to lobby for this, and I just want to uh, express my feeling that, my strong feeling, um, that this should be something, that the tax, this should not be a a, an expense that the taxpayers should be bearing. This should be an expense that the peop, that the that the that the company should be bearing. This is that you all are not um, regulated utilities. You you can pick and choose what neighborhoods you go to, and you do pick and choose what neighborhoods you go to. You and I discussed this on Friday, um, and. If it was a regulated utility and everybody was everybody in town was guaranteed the service, including low-income neighborhoods and, and, and everybody could be served, I might feel differently about it. But in a situation where this is a unregulated profit-making business, I've been in an unregulated profit-making business myself for 30 years, I have no problems with it, but I do think that this is not something that the taxpayer should bear, and I just want to uh, express my strong disappointment that you all took that action. Uh, as I said, we've, you and I have spoken about it. I know we're in disagreement about that, but I feel that very, very strongly. Uh, anyway, do you have any comments on that? Yes, sir, if I may. We all, we're in agreement that the taxpayer should not bear that cost. Um, where we have a disagreement is that um, the legislature passed a fee structure that in lieu of um, fees, we would pay into a, a fund quarterly, and Durham does receive money from the industry, at and is part of that, and if I uh, remember correctly, uh, Durham, City of Durham received $20 million last year uh, from the industry, um, the telecommunications, the energy, and the gas companies, and the clarification that we wanted from the General Assembly is what we were paying into that fund for, and I think that that was clarified in that um, unless the right-of-way maintenance went above the 20 million that we should not pay fees, and anyone who is not paying into that general fund fee uh, still has to pay you permit fees. You still have permit fees on your books. So we, we definitely agree that the taxpayer should not uh, bear the burden, but I feel like we are paying into that fee for that reason. So I do believe that we are paying our share well, I'm just going to have to differ with you on that. Um, the, I, I have some figures in terms of the, the revenues uh, that we've received for the telecommunication and, and local video programming revenue. Um, most of it is for local video programming revenues, less of it is for telecommunication sales tax. But the uh, the amount that we received in, in FY16 was about $4 million, uh, down from, from the previous year, but uh, pretty consistent with previous and, years. And that was from the telecommunications portion of that? Telecommunications and local video programming, yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, we agree. I agree with that. Yeah, that's the but, total. But your total permitting cost uh, for the, that you're talking about $4 million over the next couple of years, that's for your total permitting for gas, electric, AT&T, Google, everybody. Sure, but I think we all know that this is really being driven by what AT&T and Google are doing. And, and, you frontier, all are, and frontier and Time Warner. And Frontier yes. and Time Warner, fair enough. Yes, sir. But that it's been driven by these increases. It, you know, Duke Energy is not a landlocked cable uh, 
so uh, it's being driven by what the expanding telecoms are doing. Yes, sir. Uh, so you're right, it does include everyone who's, who's doing that, but uh, it is definitely being driven not just by AT and T, and you're right. I, I'm singling you all out because you're here, and this is your perm and this is your uh, this is your uh, uh, a licensing agreement. Uh, but we will be hearing from them as well. Yes. I'm sure they'll be coming for their agreements. Um, in 2015 um, uh, or 2014, let me see if I've got this right. Um, I'm sorry, 2007-2008, uh, the, the, the legislature removed the city's authority to award or renew franchises for telecommunications services. Yes. And that's when you started collecting those fees. Right. And that's when we started collecting those fees. And we, those, those, that, that, those franchises, that, that, that franchise agreement uh, was an agreement whereby Money got paid to the city in return for you all being able to operate. Yes. And so instead what we did was we had a, a, uh, a fee system, and that fee system has been in place without challenge that I know of for, from, from 2007 to 2015, 2016. And now when you all are doing a, a tremendous amount of work, requiring, you know, all those 623 complaints have to be checked out. And not only those complaints have to be checked out, but all of your work has to be reviewed and, and needs to be reviewed, as I'm sure you agree. Yes, uh, and yet we're not able to recover anything for that. Um, I just want to tell you, I think it's wrong. I'm disappointed in, in the utilities and uh, I think it's it's hurting our taxpayers in a way that it shouldn't. Uh, I know that that, in a sense, is water under the bridge, except that what I will express to our city administration is that uh, I hope that we will find a way uh, to uh, make sure that we are recovering as much of our cost from the utilities as we can for this service. Um, and I know that uh, you all will probably be in, I'm sure you'll be in continuing discussions with our city staff, but I know you all are anxious to, for a speedy build out. And I know the other uh, telecoms are as well. But, and we all want that service in Durham. We all want that service. But I don't think it's incumbent upon us to do it at such a, to, to provide these city services at such a speed and such a level uh, as we have if you all aren't going to be uh, paying the cost and if the taxpayer is going to be bearing. So that's my thought. I'll commend that to the administration and uh, just again want to express my disappointment in uh, the way things have, have turned out. And I appreciated your call the other day, Robert, in our discussion, so thank you. Yes, sir. Are there are other comments recognized. Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As tempting as it is to leave the issue on those eloquent remarks by my colleague, Dr. Shul, I, I did want to add two, two things. First of all, that I, I agree 100% with what Steve said. It's really frustrating. Um, I know that you have a difference of opinion with some of us about the nature of the, um, the fees that are already be, being paid, the source of monies for those fees and what they're supposed to be used for. Uh, that was very artful uh, language you used that the General Assembly clarified of what those fees were for. I gotta remember to write that down and use it myself sometime. Um, but we are here to talk about this license fee. The reason, I, the second thing I wanted to mention separately is that I, in full disclosure, I was one of the members of the council who uh, asked that this item be put on the general business agenda for tonight at the last work session uh, because it was frustrating to me um, that we were seeing three separate license fees for AT&T affiliates. Um, a, a, a concern that's been expressed to me many, many times over the course of the last year and a half that I've been on this council is the, that utilities keep coming through uh, over the last year and a half, digging up the front of people's yards, uh, putting it back with some straw and whatnot, leaving the orange cables or the orange tubes or wherever the heck that stuff is, um, hanging out of the ground until the next one comes along and digs it up again and does the same thing again. 
which I suspect is in the nature of some of the complaints that we've seen on the document, which again, thank you, thanks to the staff for putting us together. That was really nice. Um, so it, it had been my frustration that led me to pull those items uh, to find out why, if all of these particular licensee, licensees were AT&T affiliates, why they couldn't figure out some way to work together. Uh, unfortunately, um, that particular line of questioning lost some steam when you uh, when you uh, explain the nature of the folks. We would love for that to happen folks. I know, I'm because at sure. this point we're paying 7,500 <laughs> for each of those licensing agreements, and we would like for that to be under one. But um, the state law says we can't, and and obviously Durham wants to be able to see who's doing what work where. Okay. Well, um, in any event, I, I, what I was going to say is um, these are at least two of these are not in the nature of the the frequent. Um, uh, folks that we've seen getting complaints around the city and certainly not that I've received so I just wanted to flag the fact that I did ask that these matters be pulled and thanks to the clarification uh, from the folks who came today I'm, I'm ready to move forward thank you mr. mayor are there other questions comments on this item if, if not we have again a recommendation by the staff that the administration approve the license agreement that we have before us move the staff's recommendation is there a second to that? I'll, I'll second it for the purpose of discussion. And I, I guess the question is, and I'll raise this to the administration, if we don't approve the license agreement, then what happens? Well, that's probably a question for the city attorney as well, Mr. Mayor, uh, in terms of what authority the council has not to grant the license. Hadn't considered what, whether you would not do that. Um, my, my guess is that, um, and I'd have to check the state law on this, um, I would suspect that AT&T would object to that and probably enjoined, uh, joined the city from not issuing the license. I guess next, who was that, Ms. Bowman? Just in case that's how Bo's standing. Well, while, while Bo is coming here, the, the end result is that it appears to me that if the license isn't a grant, and if they aren't able to do this, then people who want it won't be able to get the service. I mean, that sounds sounds the bottom line to me, and I, I'm not sure that I'm in a position to want to go to that extent. I've heard the discussion of concern about the fees and how it got about, but the bottom line is we're trying to be a wired community. You have people that want the service, and I think it would be uh, the wrong thing for this council not to allow that to happen. Uh, for those persons that wanted it. But having said that, I'm going to recognize the staff person if you have comments on that. Well, it, it was just a follow-up. Having, having talked to the city attorney's office earlier today, um, one thing that was pointed out was that the 1996 Telecommunications Act prohibits any discriminatory actions against providers performing essentially the same services within the city. So. I don't think I'm not sure and I have to defer to the city attorney if there's legal grounds based so the, on this. the point of my the language that I chose was that this isn't going to be the end of the story if you decide not to give AT&T um, uh, this license agreement I would expect that there would be some form of litigation uh, somebody's mum to know who I'm trying to recognize let me recognize Councilman Moffitt and then Councilman Shul well thank you Mr. Mayor I, I want to appreciate my colleagues, uh, Steve and Charlie, for speaking up. I, I share their angst, and I know all of us do, because um, we're, we're in now for over, we're, for several million dollars for the, the having to pay consultants because our staff can't handle the load to deal with all of the um, permits and complaints that are going on. Uh, one of the most frustrating things for me is when I get emails from citizens, from residents, who are beside themselves because they're being, they're looking for someone to help them because they're being mistreated. And those complaints have come, as you can see, um, over 500 complaints over the last few months um, based on AT&T's work. So it's frustrating to have this many complaints, it's frustrating to spend this much money, and it's frustrating to have the legislature clarify that they don't like municipalities. So um, that said, um, I will probably wind up holding my nose and voting for this um, to, because this is to, because people do want these connections and Councilmember Shul is right people in neighborhoods that probably aren't going to get these connections want them as well and that's another point of frustration 
Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, but what you and Don said, I, I agree with. I think that uh, people in Durham do want these services. I don't think we ought to not, I, I do think we ought to have AT&T have a license in Durham. I'm planning to vote for it. Uh, but I am uh, very interested in our administration's uh, thoughts uh, in the future uh, after the, uh, in the, in the uh, af after I believe the, uh, the fees have to expire at, at the end of June. Uh, about what our plan is going to be going forward in terms of dealing with the utilities. So I'll be interested in that, but I, I do plan to vote for the license and uh, appreciate it. Are the other questions on the side? Recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Um, I just wanted a clarification from our city attorney about, could, could you repeat what you said about whether we have the authority to deny the request and what would happen if we did? The issue is that you can't treat similarly situated um, utilities differently, um, and and that would, <laughs> I guess I'm giving AT and T uh, my the, 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 their legal argument, but you've asked the question. Um, uh, you're not going to be able to to pick and choose between utilities based on some arbitrary issue. If there was some some specific, and I'm not even sure what what that would be. I hadn't really uh, thought of that. But but the the challenge is going to be to have AT and T in but Google, or AT&T out and Google still in being able to do their work under their uh, presumed um, license agreement. That's gonna be the challenge. Are there further questions or comments? If not, I'm gonna call a question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. That was 18, now we've got 19. 19 is telecommunications license agreement with AT&T Corporation. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Further the discussion. Hearing none. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Move to the general business agenda, public hearings, item 26, unified development ordinance, text amendment, traffic impact analysis, expiration. Thank you very much, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Before I begin, I would like to note that all required notification for Planning Department public hearing items have been performed and are on file for review. Uh, for specifically for text amendment TC 16 -0002, uh, that includes changes to the traffic impact analysis or TIA standards within the Unified Development Ordinance. A TIA is a professional study regarding the impacts of a proposed development on the roadway system and indicates any necessary improvements to that system as part of the proposed development. The UDO establishes a period of validity for TIAs, and staff has applied this period of validity to all TIAs, including those submitted as part of a zoning map change with the development plan. The city attorney's office has advised that the current text of the UDO would not allow a period of validity to be applied to a TIA associated with the development plan. Therefore, staff has initiated this uh, amendment to section 3.3 .3 and 3. Uh, TIA uh, traffic impact analysis and section 3.5 zoning map change to clarify that uh, expiration of a TIA uh, also applies to TIAs approved along with the development plan and to establish procedures for such a TIA, TIA such if a TIA has expired, I'm sorry, uh, and that is found in attachment A. The Joint City County Planning Committee reviewed the proposed amendments at its August 3rd 2016 meeting, the Planning Commission recommended denial 5 to 7 of the text amendment at the December 13th, 2016 meeting. Staff has addressed the concerns raised by the Planning Commission and to better execute the intent of the amendments. Thus, the text amendment proposed for City Council and Board of Commissioners approval is a revised version, and that's your attachment A. In short, the section of concern raised by the Planning Commission has been removed, and staff further clarified the text to reflect the past practice of staff that a new TIA will be required and any new mitigation measures will be required in addition to those committed on the development plan. As a reminder, council will be required to take two actions. The first will be an action on the ordinance amendment itself, and that's attachment A. And the second would be an action on the appropriate statement of consistency found as, found as, as attachment B. Uh, thank you, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, you've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. I would ask first other questions by members of the council on the staff report. If not, I have one person that has signed up to speak on this item, item 26, uh, Patrick Biker. 
Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight representing, I'm sorry, I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham at 112 West Main Street. I'm here tonight representing Tri Properties and Reader and Partners who are developing Beth Page, a 400 acre development approved for 1,100 residences, 150,000 square feet of retail, and over a million square feet of office space. I'm also here representing Craig Davis Properties, the developer of Davis Park, which contains almost 200 acres. And it will consist of about 1,200 residences, over 100,000 square feet of retail, and 700,000 square feet of office. It has been quite a few years, but my recollection is that both of these large master plan developments received unanimous approval from the City Council. These two master plan developments are moving forward, providing new residences and job opportunities in the City of Durham. I'm here tonight to oppose this text amendment, and I strongly agree with the analysis put forward by Planning Commissioner Tom Miller, whose comments are in your agenda package. Commissioner Miller stated, quote, this procedural requirement, if adopted, would be unlawful because it presumes to tell a property owner that he cannot develop his property as it is currently zoned. He went on to say, the TIA guides us in making regulatory decisions. It is not part of the regulations itself. We cannot incorporate it into the zoning regulations and give it an expiry date, unquote. Tom Miller's colleague, on the Planning Commission and also my colleague at Morningstar Law Group, Planning Commissioner Neil Ghosh, had the following to say, which is also in your attachment, quote, I want to point out the lack of a rational nexus. If nine years ago the project was expected to produce X amount of trips, how can it be expected to produce more than X amount of trips today? In other words, how does the passage of time affect the expected traffic impacts of the same proposed development? The answer is it does not. Therefore, a traffic problem that exists today but did not exist nine years ago cannot be the fault of an undeveloped project." Unquote. Accordingly, it is clear to me that this proposed text amendment has legal challenges. I'd be remiss if I did not point out the provisions of North Carolina General Statute 6-21.7, which allows for a judge potentially to award attorney's fees to a party who successfully challenges a city's action for being outside its authority. I would also be remiss if I did not point out that Beth Page and Davis Park are master plan developments located very close to the Wake County line. I am sure that the cities next to us in Wake County do not require their developments to spend one thin dime on traffic improvements in Durham, even though many of those Wake County residents work here every day. However, these Durham projects that I referenced are forced to pay for traffic improvements due to all those folks in Wake County who drive here every day to work here. And so the long story short is the more Wake County grows, the more Durham projects have to pay for these traffic improvements. That is just not right. For all these reasons, I respectfully ask for your disapproval of this text amendment, or as an alternative, please have this text amendment only apply to zoning map changes approved after March 31, 2017. Last, I'd just like to ask if that's not appealing, please reference the North Carolina Permit Extension Act so that that would apply to this text amendment so that TIAs would be granted another three years of validity. This text amendment makes it very difficult for master plan projects that I referred to that are 200, 400 acres in size to be developed within an eight year time frame. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have and I thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, let me ask so there are other persons that want to speak on this item before I get back to the council. Is anyone else that wants to speak on this item? No, the matter's back before the council. I haven't closed the public hearing yet, but the matter's back before the council. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I'd like that. I, I, I'm trying to understand the issue, the changes that were made since the Planning Commission meeting and the impacts of all this. So let me start by, by saying that if I understand this correctly, yeah, there's zoning. Every piece of property has a zoning on it. Some of those have a development plan on them and some do not. If it has no development plan on it, is there ever a time that a TIA is required? Yes. Okay, and when, what is that time? When they submit a site plan for approval and it trips a threshold requiring the site, the TIA. Okay, okay. and then um, when that happens, we're talking about no, no development plan, 
Um, at that point, does our local and state DOTs weigh in with improvements that they require before the site plan can move forward? Correct. Then when we have a development plan, when is the TIA, I mean, I know the answer, but I want everybody to know the answer. When is the TIA um, required? Same thresholds when there's a determination through the development review process that's going to trip a certain threshold. But the TIA for no development plan is required when the site plan is submitted. Correct. But the TIA with a development plan is required with the development plan. Correct. Before the site plan. Correct. And um, so, and then I got to wondering, why is that? Right. But now we're going in with the development plan, and we're actually putting in required elements, right? That would, it seems like, based on the way we do things with no development plan, if we just waited until they came up with a site plan and they submitted the TIA and they'd have to make their improvements, then all this would be a moot point, would it not? It would be. This is a practice that has, that has happened even prior to the UDO and, and the policy direction that has come through when you go through the rezoning there's always been interest as to the impacts that that development's going to have on the roadway system and try to, these are committed elements. So an applicant doesn't have to commit to those TIA improvements. They are committed elements by the applicant mm -hmm. at that time. D um, um, so NCDOT, I assume, wants to see a TIA, no development plan. Now I have a site plan. Mm -hmm. they, want to, they want to see a TIA under certain circumstances when thresholds are met. Is that correct? Correct. Um, once the development plan is approved, does NCDOT come back later and want to see a new TIA? I mean, if we're, there's we're, no TIA required. No, I mean, yeah. with TIAs, like for example, the, um, uh, Mr. Biker brought up two cases, mm -hmm. two large scale developments. Right. I'm sure there are others. Um, there's a development plan, it, the TIA is done before, uh, before there's a site plan, right? Mm -hmm. When the site plan is submitted, does NCDOT want to see another TIA? They or don't, are they but satisfied? They, they, do re they do review site plans and they'll issue comments on it based upon the requirements that they've already issued through the development plan. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you aware of them ever requiring additional traffic mitigation when the site plan is reviewed? I'm not, but have there been changes? To the, okay. I'm just trying to understand, like, Yep. Uh, Bill Judge with Transportation. Yes, uh, NCDOT participates in our review of development plans and TIAs, um, really just to try to improve the process, but there's really no commitment or obligation for them to follow any comments or requirements that are issued as part of the development plan. Their actual authority is at the time of site plan or driveway permit issue. So. If there's concerns that come up after the zoning's approved, they always have that ability to require additional analysis or additional improvements. So in, in the case of the two projects that Mr. Biker was talking about, Beth Page and Craig Davis Properties, um, in those cases, when a site plan is submitted, the developer might be required to provide additional um, traffic mitigation measures? Um, they very well could um, where they're impacting NCDOT roads. Um, I will say that they do a, NCDOT does try to um, participate in our process and provide those comments up front so as to minimize impacts or, or changing requirements to applicants. So it's, it's relatively rare, but they do have that authority that they could do that. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Stein, I, I, I wanna um, ask a question too about the point that's been raised that we, when we do a development plan zoning and we have committed elements in it, the committed elements, according to planning commission members, um, the, those committed elements become part of the zoning. Would you Correct. agree with that? Correct. And, and um, they make the case that if you, if you say, well, gosh, you know, some period of time has elapsed, so therefore your zoning is no longer valid I, I can see I, you've got your attorney behind you shaking his head so you might <laughs> Don O'Toole from the city attorney's office I, I guess what I would say is the way the tech the UDO text change has been modified alleviates the problem that you're saying bottom line is 
before this tax change was proposed, it was always understood, I believe, by the city council that originally appro approved these UDO provisions, planning and the transportation department, that TIAs, even with development plan rezonings, could expire. Mr. Biker actually brought forward a project about two years ago and complained about that and said that that was a problem, that if there are committed elements in the development plan, then um, it, it can't be changed. The change here is to clarify that um, TIAs do expire, even with regard to a development plan rezoning, and that when a new TIA is done, and they would only expire eight years after the initial rezoning. When that TIA is done, if additional transportation requirements are required, that the applicant would have to agree to those in addition to what's already approved in the committed elements for the development plan. Is that the same, would you, would you say that is the same as for a zone, a use zone that does not have a de development plan? In other words, are, does, does the, the property owner, the property owner with a development plan or no development plan, would they be in the same situation in regards to, the difference is of course with no development plan that the, the uh, property owner has no current requirements for traffic mitigation, right? So I'm just trying to wrap my head around, like, because, because I think the problem is, um, I noticed that you said that the TIA expires eight years after the zoning approval, which makes it sound like it's part of the zoning, but if I understand your argument, the TIA is actually just a tool. Correct. To and it's to actually eight elements. years after the TIA is, is um, completed that it expires, right? Correct. It's not attached to the zoning. The TIA approval. is not, the committed elements are. Right. So any traffic improvements that are the result of a TIA, those become committed elements in the development plan zoning. Okay, so I may have another question, but I have to think about it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there other questions? I recognize Councilman Reese. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying. If we vote for this particular amendment, is that s suggesting that every TIA that's currently in existence that is older than eight years is automatically invalid if today? It has, if it has not been enacted upon, yes. If someone got a zoning back in 1995 with the development plan of TIA and hasn't acted upon that development plan, so there was, say there was a development plan for office, right? And the TIA was done for office or other office uses. But the house that's on that property back in 1995 is still there, someone's living there, but now they want to build an office on it. Well, conditions have changed since 1995. So it's saying that we want to take into consider and analyze those conditions and roadway improvements to make sure that A, that anything that was committed on that development plan obviously would still be in, in play, but what are the new mitigation measures that we'd normally even require, even if it didn't have a development plan on it that we'd require anyway because it's tripping the threshold that we would take a look at those mitigation measures also. Okay, well, I, I appreciate your example of 1995, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? Right, but it's an example of an expired TIA, so it could be 1995, 2005, the date really doesn't matter, you're right, but I'm just saying if it's an old development plan, then yes. Okay, so bear with me. To the extent that a developer has acted in reliance on the TIA that they prepared and the development plan that they put forward, under what authority does this council propose to change the terms of that? I, I don't understand how that works, no like one, legally. Yeah. No, no, one's, no one's changing the authority. The zoning, all, all the requirements of the zoning are in play. You're enacting additional review, and just as if it was a site plan submittal, you're asking, you're requiring review of that site plan and determining what are the mitigation measures needed based upon the threshold requiring the TIA. The developer was entitled to do a particular thing a particular way 
we're passing changes to the law that makes them no longer able to do that thing that way. Isn't that correct? I mean, I, I'm a lawyer, but I'm, I'm not this kind of lawyer, but that seems like the gist of what we're doing, right? Well, yes, but we, we change zoning and zoning regulations all the time. And if you have a house and you built a house back in 1995, the rules for building the house, if you want to do additions on it, you don't go to the 1995 rules for building the house, you go to the 2017 rules for building a house. Um, Don, can you help me understand how this isn't a taking? How what? This isn't a taking? It isn't a taking because no value is being taken from the property. Bottom it, it, line wait, is... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and, and, and the expiration of a TIA certainly changes the value of that property. <laughs> and it changes the use to which the developer can put it, right? I, I guess what I would say is the TIA is not part of the zoning. So the TIA... But it triggers committed elements, correct? Like it, it, the things the TIA requires are required to be committed elements. Isn't that what I just heard? So the TIA that is used up front to, to develop a development plan rezoning, that study is done. Committed elements come out of that. Council considers that and decides, okay, we're going to approve this development plan with these committed elements. It's understood at the time that a TI, the TIA, it, its period of validity is eight years. If no development occurs on that property over a period of eight years, what this is saying is uh, upon some new a submittal to planning, a new TIA would be required and transportation DOT planning would all need to look at it and look at all of the changed circumstances that occurred had occurred around that neighborhood and figure out what, if any, additional mitigation measures are required. I appreciate it. Thank you for your, for your opinion. I appreciate it. Um, I have a question for planning again. Um, this is a process question. I'm still relatively new in this job. Um, I don't think I've seen a, uh, I'll, I'll spare you all. I, I, I don't think I've seen uh, an, a text amendment proposed by the administration that's been uh, voted on disfavorably by the Planning Commission and then continue to be brought forward here. Is there no mechanism for staff to, to make revisions and then bring it back to the Planning Commission? Or is this what has to happen? It just has to come to us. It doesn't us. have to happen like this. What we felt was that we heard what the Planning Commission said and we read the comments and we took a look at the draft text again. And normally, I'll back up, normally, when Planning Commission, and it's not uncommon for Planning Commission members to have issues with text. So most of the time they'll say, okay, can you make these changes or, or can you consider these changes? And we go ahead and do that and they vote on it. Um, and in this case, they voted denial, but we still felt that we needed to take a look at the changes based upon the comments that we heard. And we agreed that the way the, the, way the text was written was not written in a clear, clear way that thus brought up the comments that were, that were generated. We feel that we've kind of backed out from, we, we might have gotten a little too if then with the text that created confusion or not being unclear. Um, thus we backed out and just made it very clear and simple. You can always develop with what you are zoned to do. This is just an addition, this is just the requirement for, just as if it was a site plan, you'd come in for a TIA if it expired and do those additional committed elements. Um, you also have the right to, if you feel, they have the right to also seek rezonings if they feel that it would be helpful to, they need to get out of what they've already committed to because of the change circumstances of the TIA and they might not need those committed elements. So they can come back in and ask council to say, hey, we have this new TIA, we don't need these road improvements, we're just here to change our development plan committed elements. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to recognize Councilman Davis and then the Mayor Pro Tem. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think the last comments you made indicates that whatever decision we make tonight, um, the people who have pending um, developments and plans uh, will be notified of the change and that they would give, be given the opportunity to comply with the policy that we passed tonight if we chose to do so. Yeah, we could do a letter to industry, correct. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I, 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 Ed asks, are you going to do that if it's passed? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Recognizing their pro tem. I just need clarification on whether or not it is something that we can legally do. And secondly, recall for me, uh, Michael, the discussion at the Joint City County Planning Committee. We just looked at the proposed amendment and can you remember, Don, we didn't recommend anything. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, typically, we see it before it goes to the Planning Commission. Right. I we know. don't, and, you know, we, we, we it certainly none of these issues occurred to me at that time. Right. And um, I find the, the, the Planning Commission's comments invaluable as well as the, the uh, perspectives of my colleagues. So. Okay. Okay. Well, it just doesn't seem fair for us to uh, penalize if you will, uh, projects that have already begun. That's just my two cents. Recognize Council, well, Councilman Johnson and Councilman Shee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think, <clears throat> I'm sorry, like so many things, this kind of comes down to a question of litigation risk, whether this is a taking or not a taking in the opinion of our city attorney, it's not. Some of the um, planning commissioners thought maybe it was. The fact that we have a development lawyer here, you know, arguing against it makes me wonder whether we are facing some sort of litigation as a result of this. And so I wanted to just ask um, Don what, you know, what your opinion is on that. Like, is this, you're recommending that we go forward with this. Does that mean that you think that the litigation risk is minimal or that we can survive a challenge. Don O'Toole, City Attorney's Office. The, the truth behind this whole initiative was trying to implement what we thought would be council's desire. So at the end of the day, whatever council chooses to do, if you're comfortable with a D plan rezoning that sits on the shelf for years, and maybe the transportation conditions around that project have changed, and you don't believe a restudy is required, then, then I, don't, I don't think it's necessary that we move forward with this. But if you're asking me whether this is a taking, I do not believe it's a taking. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think, I think that it's correct that we don't want projects developed after eight years without traffic review. The question is just whether we can do that legally and if this is a way to do that legally. So, yeah, that, thank you. Recognize Council Moffat again. No, oh, I'm sorry. Shul and then Mark. Mr. Mayor. So, Mike, yes. um, first of all, I want to thank you. I always feel like um, you're like our attorneys. You're the person that reads everything that none of the rest of us read. <laughs> and you write most of it. Uh, so let me just give you my appreciation for, the, you know, I know that every time we get one of these ordinances that, it's complicated and intricate that your 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 uh, imprimatur is on it, and just want to appreciate that. And similarly, the work of the the, the hidden hand of the city attorney's office as well. <laughs> um, so, could you describe? So, so we have a current practice, and and as opposed to so, can you describe what our current practice is? with a rezoning, regarding a TIA for a rezoning with a D plan and without a D plan? So without a D plan, there's no TIA review. There's nothing remotely being locked down with the rezoning um, to generate that task for review. Thus, if you approve OI zoning without a development plan, when someone comes in for a site plan to, to do something that OI zoning allows you to do, then the TIA is required at that time. With the, if they're doing OID and they're proposing uses that would trip the whatever the threshold is, 150 trips, uh, peak hour trips, then the TIA would be required at that time. And then based upon the mitigation measures that are revealed, then they, they would be committed to or can be committed to as part of the development plan. So yeah, but talk to me through the eight year thing or the five year. The so once so site plan and one so if there was no development plan, uh, site plan site plans actually have a, only a four year validity. This doubles that. So if a site plan goes 
become expires, no one act no one acts on that site plan, someone could still make use of the existing TIA and submit a new site plan as long as it's been within that eight, uh, eight uh, year time frame. Um, same thing generally with the t TIA for development plan, you can submit site plans under that same TIA, but the starting point is with the development plan approval, not within that initial site plan approval. So it's just a change in the starting point. But, and so let's say that the, the with the development with the D plan, the um, the eight years passes, mm -hmm. then so what is our current practice? Well, the current practice is not to require a TIA because we are instructed by the city attorney's office that the text wouldn't allow us to do that. Okay. Before your instruction, so when did the instruction from the city attorney's office? Was it a year or so? About two years two ago. Two years ago. Yeah. And prior to that, what was our practice? The practice was that once it expires and a new TIA was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but um, was that we would require a TIA and you would be required to do what the development plan says you're you committed to or whoever did the t development plan not you in general um, and then plus whatever the other mitigation measures were determined necessary yeah and so and you know so I'm not sure if this is for you Mike or I'm not sure which of you all would want to take this but so one of the things that uh, Patrick said is that we, we have uh, that that uh, and that these were in the com these were embodied in uh, Neil Gosh's comments as well in the Planning Commission, which was that there's a TIA and it's it it, it it applies to a certain development and that development's the traffic that it's generating and and then there's the t that leads to certain committed elements and right. then those elements are incorporated into the D plan and this council votes in favor of it and there it is, and that. There are no that 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 is predicting the future traffic generated out of that development, and that that development's not that that's not going to change. That development has a some sort of range of units, and 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 that TIA is is projected on I would assume sort of the maximum number of units that that developer would be building there. And so I think if I'm following Patrick's line of argument, it is that. Therefore, what is generated out of that development is not changing, and therefore there should be no need for any more committed elements on the part of that development, even if traffic in that area, in, even if traffic in that area expands for other reasons. Patrick is blaming Wake County. Um, always a fa always a enjoyable, you know, I like blaming them too. Um, but I wondered if you or someone else could comment sort of on that, you know, you know respond to that argument or in, in any sort of policy way. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. The, uh, um, I'm not sure I heard all your questions. So. Do, you want, do you want me to ask it again? Yes, if you could. So my question is, if I, I hope I can boil it down. My, my, my assumption about a TIA that has been adopted into a D plan is that, into, is that the, I'm sorry, the TIA which has led to committed elements that have been adopted into a development plan is that that TIA was based on the maximum number of trips that would be generated out of that development if it was fully built out. And that, as I understand Patrick's argument, it is that that doesn't change in eight years or in 12 years. That is to say that development, whether it be Bethpage or any other, has a maximum extent to which it is to be built out. And those traffic, those can, and that those trips generated out of there are already somehow accounted for in the original T or are accounted for in the TIA, in the original TIA, and that any change in circumstances would be generated not by that development because it's already accounted for in, in the TIA, but would be from other traffic that is, you know, be, you know, other other things that are happening around it, and that therefore the developer should not bear the burden of having to deal with those improvements, which are not due to their Okay, that, that probably wasn't any clearer, but yeah. there you go. No, That's my um, I, no I think I understand. The, uh, yes, so the, uh, 
the TIA includes a number of assumptions, one of which is a trip generation component for the site. Um, there are provisions in the ordinance that basically, because there's so many different uses on most of these zonings that, that they could ultimately end up submitting site plans for that limit basically significant deviations from the TIA. So they, they can't es underestimate the number of trips and then come in with a site plan for something that's going to generate significantly more trips. So that is true. That, that part is correct. Um, one of the other assumptions, though, is they estimate a build-out year. Um, so generally they predict the traffic growing out two, three, four years or almost, I don't recall any, ever getting one that was more than eight years after. So our period of validity is always generally beyond that, that, um, that estimate it for when they're, they're estimating traffic conditions and mitigating back to, to accommodate or to address those issues with other developments that may be occurring in the area. I'm sorry, Bill, I missed, could you explain that last part again? I apologize. So, yeah. So one of the assumptions that the TIA has when they submit it with the development plan, site plan, whenever the TIA is first prepared, is they estimate traffic conditions one year after a build out. So they assume a build out year of the development. It's, a, I don't, it's almost always about two, three years out. Um, they generally assume pretty aggressive growth that they're gonna be able to get their site plans approved, start construction. Um, so, and as long as they're able to do that, everything works out. Our period of validity of eight years is usually well beyond that. Um, for some of the larger projects, they may have a larger growth year, but it's almost never eight years out. But, um, and so the period of validity addresses that concern so that they're looking at conditions for when the project's likely to be built out. When it languishes for eight, 10, 15 years, conditions change and while they're estimating the trips for the site, they haven't taken into account the changing conditions for other development in the area. So, and I, I'm not, this is really more, I think, a question for us than for you, but any comment that you or Sarah or anyone else has to make on this, which is, is it, you know, thinking about this in a pop, from a policy standpoint, is it, is it, is it good policy or is it fair to say to the developer, you have, um, you have a TIA that applies to your development, and from that TIA you have developed certain committed elements. That those committed elements have been adopted into the development plan, and the development plan has passed city council, and now. Um, and now that you can depend on that, and we don't expect any more trips than that to be developed, to be generated from your development. But conditions change, and they can change. You know, they can change a lot over that period of time, and therefore you, the developer, are responsible for potentially responsible for the new trips generated by others. I'm just not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with what is a TIA, uh, you know, so, so when we do a TIA now, we're looking at all the traffic conditions for sure, but we're mainly looking at the new traffic that's generated by that development. And so, you know, I'm just interested in your thoughts about, I, I'm struggling to understand why that's fair to the developer and, you know, I'm. So, can you oh. help me? Well, the, uh, the mitigation requirements, the required improvements are, that developers are required to make are to improve the level of service depending on the, the area of the comprehensive plan. Uh, typically, most areas, it's a level of service D or better. So they're looking at not only addressing their traffic, but any existing deficiencies within that build-out year. So um, in the downtown or compact neighborhoods, it's a little lower level of service E where we're anticipating a little higher level of delay due to urbanized conditions. Um, but um, so that's generally the, the purpose behind the TIA and the required improvements is to meet that required level of service threshold. Okay, Mr. Mayor, which is one or two more, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, and so when we do a TIA now, 
we're looking at the, and, and we're making a requirement into the D plan, or, or there, we're not making a requirement, when the committed element comes to us as part of the development plan and we vote for it, that committed element or that, that TIA which leads to that committed element is, is considering all of the traffic in the area, and, but especially it's considering what that development is adding to it, which is going to change the level of service you know, and therefore more roads are needed, more. So are we saying to a developer, and we're going to look at all of that again in eight years, if you haven't developed, we're going to look at all of that again, and we're going to require you to be responsible for improvements, potentially responsible for improvements, which are not of your making. Which are from results, which are from traffic that's not of your making. If I might, Sarah Young with the planning department. I think one way to look at this um, that certainly staff has tried to take into account is that uh, a TIA is a snapshot in time of both, as, as Bill, as Mr. Judge explained, the trips generated by the proposed development, but also the existing on the ground conditions. And between the time that the initial TIA with the development plan happens, a lot of other developments by right without needing a rezoning could come online and change those conditions. If, if the subject of the development plan, for instance, didn't need one and it was operating by right and it came in 10 years later, its TIA would have to account for those things. Okay. So there's no way for us to reconcile um, the fact that if you wait long enough, things will certainly change and we have parts of the community that are changing rapidly. Um, so that's one of the things that we were trying to address is how do you uh, make it fair so that we don't get complaints from citizens about our roads being, uh, you know, above or below a level of service, over capacity, and then we have to stand up and say, well, the TIA said it was okay. So we were trying to come up with a way that was fair. We could do different things, um, change the effective date so it would only apply to uh, development plans uh, submitted beyond the effective date. Um, we could look at some other options. Certainly there's the option to refer it back to staff and say, Staff, we're, we're not happy with the proposal. Um, think about it some more. So we're open to whatever policy guidance you all want to give us. Thank you. I, I, have, I think I have some more questions, but not right now, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We'll try to get to someone that hasn't spoken. Back to Councilman Mark. Thank you, sir. I was going to ask uh, about Popeyes, but go ahead. Excuse me? That's about Popeyes. <laughs> I thought that's what you said, but I. So um, I have a question for Mr. Stock. Mr. Stock, uh, earlier you said um, if, a, if a site plan is languished or a, de uh, a project is languished for um, 10 years, 12 years, no one has acted upon the property, can you be more specific? What does that mean? If I have a 200-acre project and I'm working on 50 acres of it over here, does, does that mitigate, does, does it make this whole conversation then is not relevant to that project? Not necessarily. If, if, it's, if they're only acting upon, um, site plans can be, you know, come in as portions of sites or the entire sites. Um, and site, so the site plans are, in, the exp expiration are per site plan, not per. So, so the, 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 when this would take effect would be when the, when, if a site plan was submitted longer than eight years after the TIA was completed? Correct. Okay. Uh, so it's, all right, that's, thank you. And then I wanted to ask a question, Mr. Judge. Um, you said that um, if it happens eight or 10, 12 years later, the, the, uh, the applicant's TIA is not taking into consideration the current conditions. But once a, once a, when I, I thought the way it worked, if I want to go down on 751, and I want to do a project down there, I'm going to have to take into account all of the traffic that 751 South is supposed to generate. And I'm going to have to mitigate beyond what they're doing. Is that not true? Um, yes, uh, generally that's true as long as um, 751 South TIA remains valid. So um, at some point, 
as these projects reach their period of validity, we no longer, we have not been requiring them to include that as adjacent development with the understanding that they would have to come back and do this prior up to, I guess, almost two years ago when this was pointed out, this, this issue, but um, with the period of validity. Okay. So, to me, it seems like the problem is that we're treating um, projects with development plans differently. And that is, and, and I understand that, right? Somebody comes in, they say, I want to do a, a rezoning on 200 acres. And people say, well, what are the impacts? And how are we going to know what the traffic impacts are without a TIA? So we say, let's do a TIA. TIA then lists a bunch of <coughs> mitigations. And then we wind up saying, well, let's go ahead and put the, let's, the, you know, ask the developer if they would meet those concerns by agreeing to proffer those committed elements. And then suddenly it seems like that the, the, the um, improvements when we start talking about, when you might have to do more improvements, it seems like we're now disrupting, I mean, um, as a layperson, that we're disrupting the, the um, zone, the use zone. And that really what we should be doing, it seems like, is to say, look, when you do a development plan, we want to see a TIA so that well, everybody knows what the impacts are. We'll even list out all of the mitigations that you'd have to do if you submitted a site plan today. But we don't need you to commit to it because you're going to have to do them anyway when you submit your site plan. And then, then we would be on the same basis as no development plan. And, and it doesn't seem like there would be an issue because we'd no longer be looking at committed elements changing, if you will. But in any case, Mr. Mayor, I, something somebody said earlier triggered something to me, and I think that since when I was on the Planning Commission, I had time to really delve into these issues and, and focus on them. But um, we deal with a lot of different matters. Now, what we've heard the staff say is they've made material changes to the um, proposed ordinance since the, the Planning Commission uh, took a look at it. We've had some persuasive arguments by people on the Planning Commission, and I would like to um, suggest that we send it back to staff to have them return to the Planning Commission and let us get an in-depth review from the Planning Commission on the changes that have been submitted. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? I think that's a good idea. Me too. Excellent idea. Well, this is a public hearing now. Uh, you want me to close the public hearing with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Uh, entertain a motion on item. So mo I'll move that we um, refer the item back to staff with the understanding that um, the Planning Commission, we're going to get an opportunity for the Planning Commission to give us an opinion on the revi revisions. Second. Been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Right. Let's move to the next item, which is the item 27, street closing of Shawnee Street, street closing 14000020. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, Lindsay Smart proposes to close an approximate 180 foot linear foot portion of Shawnee Street. Um, this right of way is currently bordered by property owned by Ms. Smart and her husband, uh, John and Megan McVeigh, and the city of Durham. Um, it's also located directly north of an abandoned Norfolk and Southern rail line. Um, if this request is approved, the right of way will be divided amongst the three property owners, and a 20 foot bicycle and pedestrian easement is proposed to be reserved. Um, along the, the, excuse me, the McVeigh's property. Uh, the purpose of this easement would be a greenway and pedestrian easement for access to the rail line. Um, that item is also included for consideration by council this evening and can be seen as attachment six in your packet. Um, staff has no issues with this proposal at this time and recommends the closure of this right of way. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay, the public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Let me ask other questions by members of the council on this item. Uh, is anyone in the audience who wants to speak on this item? No one has signed up to speak. Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience asked to speak on this item. I declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. 
It passes seven to zero. Uh, Move to item 28, consolidated annexation for Mount Level Missionary. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again. Um, this is a request for extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning, which has been received from Mount Level Missionary Baptist Church, um, located at the southeastern corner of Denfield Street at Hebron Road. Um, this request comprises approximately six contiguous acres. Um, a place of worship is currently located at the subject site, um, and if this request is approved, the applicant intends to expand that place of worship through an associated site plan and minor special use permit. Staff is recommending an initial zoning designation of residential suburban 10 and residential suburban 20 and Falls Jordan B overlay for the subject site. Um, this is an exact translation of the existing county's designated zoning. Um, if approved, the annexation will become effective on March 31st, to, uh, March 31st, 2017. Public Works and Water Management performed the utility impact analysis, which indicated that the existing um, city of water and sewer services have capacity to serve this project. And Budget Management Services performed a fiscal impact analysis, which did indicate that the request would be ultimately become revenue negative, which is not uncommon for places of worship given their exempt property tax status. Um, staff recommends that the council approve the utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zone, zoning designation, and adopt a consistency statement. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay, before we move to the public, let me ask other questions by the council of the council of the staff's recommendations. If not, uh, we have one, two, three, four persons that signed up to speak on this item. Uh, three have indicated their proponents. I don't have uh, Ms. Tasha Phillips. Ask questions. Answer, Answer questions. Oh, okay. Uh, recognize Mr. James Covington, followed by Ron Peterson and Robert Jones. In that order, if you can come to the podium to my right, please. You can set your name and address, and you have three minutes on the side. Okay. My name is James Covington, 6094 Grinstead Court, Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I serve as the uh, assisting the owner with civil site and planning matters during the annexation. So I'm with Covington and Associates, located at 811 Suite B, Euler Street in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I'm just here in the event there are any technical questions that need to be answered. Right. And I think the, the other members that you have that turned in uh, uh, forms as well are here for any questions that may, uh, that, that, more, that are more appropriate for the church to respond to any questions. Well, let me just call the names and make sure that, uh, is this Ron Peterson, Peters? And same thing for Robert Jones. All right. And Tasha Phillips is the same. Okay, let me ask the council their questions of any of these persons that are so represented. Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Matters back before the council. Been proper to move the second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Then properly move and second, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote? It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. I know y'all are expecting that same long discussion we had on the last one we didn't give it to you. <laughs> Twenty-nine is consolidated annexation for Shallow Glen One and Two. Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Uh, this request is a utility. Um, or, sorry, this is an annexation request comprising a utility extension agreement, annexation petition, and zoning map change from SP Shallow LLC for three parcels um, and public right of way totaling approximately sixty acres. Uh, generally located on the western side of Slater Road at Shallow Glen Drive. Um, 
These two annexation cases represent an extension of the existing city limit, um, and the applicant ultimately intends to construct office and warehouses uses at the subject site if this request is approved. Um, in addition, the applicant has requested a zoning designation of industrial light. Um, two of the parcels on the site are currently designated as industrial light, so those would be an exact translation of the existing zoning. The applicant submitted a separate rezoning petition for one of the parcels to also um, receive the industrial light designation. If these cases are approved, this request would become effective on March 31st, 2017. The Public Works and Water Management Departments performed the utility impact analysis for the utility extension agreement, which indicated that the existing city of Durham water main has capacity to serve this proposed project. Budget Management Services Department performed the fiscal impact analysis, which determined that the proposed annexation is expected to become revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Um, and staff recommends that the council approve the annexation petition, the utility extension agreement, initial zoning requests, as well as adopt a consistency statement. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay. Other questions of the staff? Uh, we have one person that signed up to speak, Patrick Biker. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bell. Um, just here on behalf of the developer, uh, SP Shiloh LLC, uh, with my friend uh, Mike Kane, who's our project engineer. We're just here to answer any questions, and we want to thank the uh, administration and the Planning Commission for their support. Thank you for your time tonight. I saw there are questions by members of the council of the developers. Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. The matter's back before the council. Now, this, there are three separate items utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation petitions, and initial zoning. All of those. The voluntary we annexation. Do them separately? Or? We say we can do them all together. Jacob Williams with Planning Department, yes, the, the two zoning ordinances, you could do those as part of one okay. motion. Right. Is that the no motion to stand? Is there a second to that? Second. Uh, no questions. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. That concludes all of the agenda items. Any other items to come before the council? If not, we're adjourned at 8.46 p.m. Thank you. So we adjourn at 8.